Well, good morning, Echo Church. How are we doing out there? Yeah. Hey, I am so honored to be with you all. Everybody up at our Fremont campus with Pastor Paul and Karen, I hope you're doing well. Over at Sunnyvale with Gene and Queen and online with Pastor Tim and Jasmine. Everyone here at North San Jose, I love y'all. Can we just give it up for everybody joining us today? Hey, we have been in the middle of a series called Neighboring on Purpose. We began to think about what life would look like, where we live, work, study, and play, if we became intentional about being good neighbors. And through the series, Pastor Felipe challenged us to realize we all have a tone and a level of influence. Shauna Pilgreen came and told us what it looks like to be called to a region. And then last week, we explored the idea and the power of being in community. And today, I am excited because the Lord has placed it on my heart to lean into the power of the table, this idea of radically ordinary hospitality and what that can do to the people's lives that we surround ourselves with. Now, at all of our campuses, right here in this room, everyone online, uh, you can write it online or you can raise your hand at our other campuses. If you have a different set of expectations when you walk into McDonald's and Maggiano's, could you just raise your hand with me? If you think that you're going to get a different level of service at McDonald's than you are at Maggiano's. If you've never been to Maggiano's, it is much different than McDonald's. White tablecloths, it's beautiful. But I ask that because we have a value here at Echo. It goes like this. It says, we set the table. It's about expectation. That's why when you drive on to one of our physical campuses, there's somebody out there with a yellow vest and hopefully a big smile directing you which way to go so you know when you arrive. They greet you at the door with a smile and a high five. If you have kids and you walk into our Echo Kids experience, you're greeted by individuals who love your kids and create this environment that allows them to flourish and thrive so you can come sit in here with peace of mind. As we walk into our auditoriums or watch online, we have the perfect balance of worship and production with the sights and the sounds to help us experience God. And for everybody that's watching online, they are greeted by a host and everybody else who walks through the hub has someone there to pray with them. See, we believe that if we set the table, God can do great things in our midst. And now before we dive into our message, I want to help us frame our mindset as everything that we look at today. For those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, we know that he changes the way that we look at the world. But for those who haven't yet made the decision to follow, he still has shaped a perspective on human culture. And he was asked something when he walked this earth. Somebody was asking, hey, what is the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing that if you were to tell us, Jesus, that we need to know? And this was his response in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as we lean into our talk today, would you allow that mindset to just permeate through your brain and lean into what Holy Spirit has for us? Would you join me in a moment of prayer? Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak individually to each and every one of us in this room right now. That whatever you have for us through this topic, our lives would be changed as we submit to you. So we invite you to come, be in this place, In Jesus' name, amen. See, before us, I have this table, this wonderful dining experience. And many of us have sat at a table like this. Maybe we're in a restaurant. Maybe the lights are dim. There's a live band playing in the corner. I want you to imagine yourself right now seated at this table. You can close your eyes, maybe get into the mood a little bit, the meal that's going to come out, the senses that you're going to experience. Who comes to your mind that you would want to sit across from you 
at that table. For me, every single day of the week, no doubt, that choice is my wife, Carla. For you, it might be a spouse, it might be a significant other, a parent, a neighbor, a friend. But I know that when Carla and I sit down at the table, we're going to talk about life, we're going to laugh, we're going to smile, sometimes we'll cry. We might have the topic of conversation around our kids. It might be work stuff. It might be goals for the future. But in your note sheet under number one, I want you to write down the name of whoever it is you wish was seated at this table with you. And once you've written them down, I'd like you to join me in an experiment for just a moment. Close your eyes again. The same environment, the same setting. But now seated across from you is the person that you despise. Maybe for you in Sunnyvale, that's a coworker who always takes the credit for all of your great ideas and your hard work. Maybe for some of you students, it's that person a few lockers down that's always giving you a hard time. Maybe for somebody watching online, you've been so hurt by an ex that you can't even bear going out to environments where you might see them again. Maybe someone over at our Fremont campus, it's a family member, that no matter how often you try to impress them or what you accomplish, they continue to point out your faults. And for some of us, it might even be the person sitting on the other side of this room. I'm going to ask you to be bold and write that person's name down in number two. And I have a question for all of us. Is do we believe that one meal with that person could change their life forever? Like, do we really believe that if we were to open ourselves up to have a vulnerable moment of conversation, to dine, to share, to encounter together, that they could leave that table radically transformed. But not only just themselves, what about you? Could you be changed forever? See, I believe that the answer to that is yes. And that is why the title of today's message is, There is Power in the Table. I wonder if you would all join me at all of our campuses on the count of three. Let's say that like we mean it. If you don't believe it, just pretend for a moment that there is power in the table. So will you join me on the count of three? Number one, I want to hear you in Sunnyvale. Two, up in Fremont and online. Three, there is power in the table. That's right. I mean, this whole idea of neighboring on purpose, it's really easy to set the table for people we like. I love having people over to my house that agree with me on everything. <laughs> there are people that I don't like at my table. I might be related to them. I don't know. But we've got folks in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces that, man, if we want to see life transformation happen, if we want to be intentional about being a good neighbor, it means we need to set the table for those who are quite different than us. And I'm hoping that as we dive into three examples from the Bible today, we will all begin to see the call that God has on our lives. So would you join me as we lean into these three stories? The first is a man named Zacchaeus. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know that Zacchaeus is a Jewish tax collector. Those two things do not go hand in hand to be liked by your peers. Just for instance, he basically is like the IRS times 10. Okay, I know, you're all like, I don't like him already, all right? He has basically chosen to side with the Romans in the Jewish culture that he lived in and exploit their finances to line his pockets before he sends the money on to Caesar. This is a guy that we probably would all not trust nor even want to be around. So let's see what happens when he interacts with Jesus in Luke chapter 19. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. 
There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief, the top dog, tax collector in the region. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road. For Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus got to that point and he came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Some of you need to know that although others don't see you, our God sees you and he knows your name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. So Zacchaeus, he quickly climbed down. He took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But, there's always a but, (laughs) but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. How dare he? Isn't Jesus supposed to be above all of these terrible people? How could he dare associate with someone? I want you to hear that as we become intentional about being a good neighbor, as we live out this idea of radically ordinary hospitality, we will displease many people around us. And Jesus, he didn't necessarily care about what other people thought. He came with an ideal and a mindset, and he said, I don't care what your view is, because I know why I'm here. And I know what happens if I interact with that person today. See, now we don't know what happened at the table. We don't get to understand what Zacchaeus asked Jesus, or maybe if Jesus rebuked him for what he did. But we get a very clear before and after, a radical life transformation. And we get a glimpse of what this looks like in verse 8. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. I'm going to multiply the hurt that I did. So then Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. See, this story brings up a question for me in my life, and I want to ask it all to you as well. Would you sit with the one that displeased many? Are you willing to allow individuals in your circle to judge you for reaching across the aisle and having dinner or pouring out into another individual? Now, I know that everyone watching and in this room is not yet a follower of Jesus. And maybe for you, you're actually desperately waiting for that invitation You feel a lot like Zacchaeus, and you have questions. I want you to know that Echo is a church that would be happy to sit with you, even if it displeased many. So much so that we've created a night and a space called Alpha. And at every single one of our campuses, as well as online, there is an environment, a judgment-free zone, where you can come And share a meal with us week after week as we explore life's big questions and the idea of faith and meaning. And I want you to know from my mouth personally that we would love for you to sit at our table and do life with us. So that's our invitation to you today. Now our second story is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. You've got to go read it. It's a story of Elisha. 
in 2 Kings chapter 6. See now, have you ever had a moment in your life where someone seems to always be one step ahead of you and they just keep messing up your plans? You know, like when the kids make the house extremely dirty and you were planning on cleaning things? Or like your neighbor shows up right in the moment that you started to hit play on Netflix and you're like, ah, I gotta do something about this. Or maybe it's that individual that just is always getting under your skin. Maybe you are that annoying person to somebody else. (laughs) I don't know. Maybe if you've never experienced that, it's you. (laughs) But that's the scenario that we find Elisha in. He's the annoying one, making his enemy really frustrated. See, the Israelites were at war with the uh, king of Aram, and he kept finding ways to take them down. Week after week after week, he's trying to find this like opportunity to seize them. But Elijah being the prophet, the one who hears from God, every time he comes up with a plan, God gives Elijah this download and he like alerts the king. Hey, this is what's going on. And they're like, okay, cool. We're going to go over here instead. And then they show up and they're like, gosh, again. And it happened over and over and over again that the king got so frustrated. He's like, who in my bedroom is telling my dirty laundry? Like, who is giving away all my secrets? And they were like, oh, it's not us. It's that dude who talks to God. He's like, well, he's a problem. We got to get rid of him. And so he sends his army to go capture Elisha. And there's this one night that he surrounds him. These enemy forces are saying, I am taking this guy out. Because sometimes for us, we feel so entitled that if we can just get rid of the source of our problems, all things go away. And in our cancel culture, we can mute and block and untag and do all these other things, and we feel like it's all rosy and peachy keen until we're confronted with it in real life. Hey, Hey, that's right. (laughs) Okay? So this is what happens. Elijah's servant walks out of the tent, and he goes, "Uh uh-oh. It's like one of those, like, crap your pants moments where all this fear overcomes you, and you're like, how am I going to get out of this? It looks really bad. And Elijah, being the dude who hears from God, he just walks out of his tent. He's like, oh, watch this, okay? So he says, hey, God, could you just open his eyes and let him see? So the Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elijah was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Like, that's how my God does it. What's up, right? Yeah, you guys think you got me? What's up? So the enemy starts to come in and attack him. And Elijah just prays a simple prayer. Hey, Lord, my servant couldn't see what you had planned for us. And yet these people are mad with anger. Would you strike them with blindness? Because they can't see clearly. They have the wrong perspective. So the Lord answers his request and he strikes them with blindness. And out of the kindness of his heart, even though he had a moment and an opportunity to strike, he led them to the proper place in front of the king. And the king walks out and he's like, what is going on? And the king asks him a very valuable question in verse 21. Should I kill him? Like the problem that has been bugging us for so long, should I just wipe him out? And then that king can't do this anymore. Elijah's like, of course not. Feed him. Do we kill prisoners of war? No, no, no. Give them food and drink and then send them home to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and he sent them home. See, what's crazy is in Psalms 23, David writes and says, My God prepares a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. What I gather from this is sometimes we're actually the one preparing the feast for those who are in opposition to us. So I got a question for you all. Are you willing to bless those who curse you? See, sometimes our perspective is limited And over time, or with some sort of exposure, or in Elijah's case, some prayer, we begin to see things differently. 
What we were blind to, we now see. Throughout this series, we have been asking you all to pick up some resources to help us in this journey. And one of those, jur- uh, one of those resources is a book called The Gospel Comes with a House Key, where the author, Rosaria Butterfield, shares her story and what this idea of radically ordinary hospitality has done to her life. I felt it was so fitting for us that I'd love for you to hear part of her story from her words. Check out the screens. We live at this time where so many Christian ideas are understood as hate speech. After the Obergefell decision legalized gay marriage, that put the gospel on a collision course with the new law of the land. And I think many Christians have been struggling with, well, how do I speak? What do I do? How do I move forward? Home is a vital place to invite your neighbors in to have some heartfelt conversations. We can love our children together. We can let some things slide, even though the world we live in would say that we're supposed to be enemies. To me, hospitality is the ground zero of the Christian faith. I was raised in an Italian family. There were some issues in my house that made it almost impossible to have people in. So hospitality didn't really become endemic to my life until I had set up a home of my own. I was a professor at Syracuse. I lived as an out lesbian feminist in New York in our LGBTQ community. Somebody's home was open every night of the week and there was never a question, where will I go if I need help? Because the community itself is organic and fluid and that was how we dealt with crises. After I wrote my tenure book, I really wanted to write a book that was on my heart. Why is the religious right such a hateful community? And why do they hate people like me? I was on a war against two things, patriarchy and stupid. So I was really curious to know why relatively decent people would use the Bible in such a hateful way. So I wrote an editorial and it brought all kinds of attention my way, which I didn't really expect, but one of the things that brought my way was a letter from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. When Ken and his wife Floyd invited me to dinner, I was happy. I, th- I thought of Ken as my unpaid research assistant. And they were fine with the fact that I-, I wanted to read the Bible to critique it. That began a research journey that changed my life. But it wasn't research that changed my life. In Ken and Floyd's home, the way that they practiced hospitality became a living, breathing example of the theology that they were teaching. After my first dinner at Ken and Floyd's house, Ken gave me a big hug. Floyd gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up next week. This was fun. Can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me, and they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful, because what it showed to me was that they didn't see me as a project. They actually saw me as a neighbor. Now, I didn't step foot in the church for two years, but every week I was in their home. And every week, it was clear that pretty much anything could go. We could ask anything. Ken and Floyd were fine. And that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. I did not come to faith because I stopped feeling like a lesbian. It's not that I got all of my worldview issues just completely cemented with a happy Christian evangelism, not at all. I came to faith because I became convicted that Jesus is who he says he is.
Ephesians 4.29 is our watchword, that we are to impart grace to the hearer. I might not agree with everything that you hold to be near and dear, but because we are neighbors, I don't have to say everything that's on my heart. And you don't have to say everything that's on your heart right now. We can put some of our worldview issues aside. And over years of this, the gospel takes on a momentum that is compelling to people. I think we need to give each other the reminder that it's God who saves. It's not about certainly us being perfect or our words being perfect, but show up we must in the lives of unbelievers. What comes naturally to me and what comes naturally to you is to hang out with people who are like us, <laughs> people who can maybe finish our sentences, people who don't scare us, but hospitality, biblically speaking, takes strangers and makes them neighbors, and takes neighbors and makes them family of God. It's a great joy to see the gospel bring people together who are supposed to be enemies, and it's a great joy to know that God never gets the address wrong. And if your neighbors aren't people you know yet, there's a blessing waiting for you. What a, yeah. What a powerful and challenging way of thinking. See, inviting people to our tables who might have an intention to curse us is something that Jesus did often. But one of the things that Jesus took it even a step further is that he invited someone to his table that he knew was going to lead to the eventual demise of his life. See, Jesus chose his 12 disciples, and one of them was named Judas. Judas walked with Jesus, talked with him, did life with him, encountered and experienced the miracles that he did all over. But there was one day where he got misaligned with the way that Jesus was taking things and found an opportunity to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus, being fully God and fully man, still invited Judas to join him for their Passover meal, knowing what he had done. And as he was sitting there with his other disciples and Judas in the upper room, they had conversation, he shared some insights but towards the end of their meal, Jesus spoke these powerful words in Luke chapter 22. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. This is a very challenging thought for us all. But I have a question for each and every one of us. Would you invite Judas to your table? Would you open up your home, your life, your experiences, and invite Judas to sit and dine with you? See, one of the most powerful quotes from Rosaria's book is, I don't love my neighbor because they love me back. No, I love my neighbor because they are mine. Jesus often invited people to sit at his table from all different walks of life. He brought prostitutes and high religious leaders, tax collectors and zealots. And for us, this table looks pretty normal. It's like a little dinner party. 
And sometimes when we have a table and an image like this, it seems okay. But what happens when there's a rivalry that is birthed at the table? You know, here in the Bay Area, we love our sports. (laughs) And we know that there's clearly some opposition. Personally, there is... There's no distinguishing fact. The Dodgers are the better team. (laughs) And we can just sit here. We can have fun. There's a lot of banter that comes with it. But what happens when our table gets a bit messy? And things go from this trivial idea of sports and turn political. What do we do with that? I know, some of you are very uncomfortable right now. (laughs) What happens when we take it a step further and now it's no longer political, it's moral and ethical? See, this table is a representation of the uncomfortability that we have all walked in for years. How could we get these people to sit at the same table? The answer is Jesus. Not only are we inviting these people to the table, but Jesus has invited each and every one of us to sit at his table. And what happens is when we come to the table, he talks to us. He loves us. He welcomes us. And over the course of time, as we get to know who he is, he presents us with the same question and example that he did to his disciples. As you sit at this table, I want you to know that I have broken my body for you. I have done this so that you would experience freedom. But not only have I given you my body, I have shed my blood. This purifying agent that will bring all things into perfect union with your creator. And we are all faced with the decision. We can continue to hold on to our identities, our ideals, our beliefs, Or we can choose in a moment to receive the bread and the blood and trade in what we brought to the table for something that is much more important. See, Jesus wants you to sit at his table, but he also wants you to make a choice. Are you willing to to put everything else aside and to love your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all of your political ideas, all of your gender stereotypes, all of your your socioeconomic values, every piece of who you are, in front of people, behind people, are you willing to give it all to him? And then second, are you willing to love people the way he loves you? If you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, I want to give you a moment and an opportunity right now. Would you just close your eyes and repeat after me? Jesus, I came to your table today with all of my own ideals and thoughts. And I don't know exactly what the next steps look like, but I trade them in to receive your body and your blood as a living sacrifice for me. And I ask that you would invite me to your table each and every day so I can become new. In Jesus' name, amen. For the rest of us, who call ourselves followers of Jesus. We really need to lean into this idea 
Are we really willing to sit and eat with the one that displeases many? Are we willing to bless those who curse us? And are we radical enough to even invite Judas to our table? If we all believe that there is power in the table and that one meal, just like Zacchaeus, could change their life and ours forever, that's what we're called to do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the example that you have given to each and every one of us. The way that we can radically change people's lives through ordinary hospitality. That as we open ourselves and become more vulnerable to others the same way that we are vulnerable to you, things can change. Would you use our lives to transform the areas where we live work, study, and play. We do all of this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand with me? At all of our campuses in just a moment, we're gonna partake in this example that Jesus gave us through a time of communion. As you walk down during the song to take of the elements, I want you to think really hard about the person that you wrote in slot number two. And I want to ask that this week you would pray for them. You would be intentional about what it would look like to invite them to your table. And allow this moment to be a moment where you ask God to show up and you commit to believing that there is power in his table. Would you worship and take communion with me? Thank you again so much for joining us today. We hope that you found this helpful. And if you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to stay updated on the latest content that we have for you. Also, we are dependent on the financial contributions of others to support and sustain our ministry. So be sure to go to echo.church slash give if you feel led to participate so that we can continue making an impact together. Thank you so much again, and we'll see you next time.